morning. Good morning. Um, it's certainly great to see all of you here this morning, and uh, again, it's certainly a, an honor and a privilege to, to, to be in any pulpit to preach the Word of God, but it's especially an honor and a privilege to be here at Toda Steve Baptist Church, where I grew up, and uh, Pastor David, thank you again for the opportunity, and uh, looking forward to, to what God has for us here this morning. Now, let me ask you all this question. Has anyone ever broken a promise they made to you? Now, you don't, you don't have to say what, what it was. <laughs> but I'm sure probably all of us here, at one point or another, had some type of promise that was broken. How did that make you feel when you found out that promise was broken? I'm sure probably for many of us, probably wasn't too happy about it. Now let me ask you this question, and this one you may definitely not want to answer in public, but have you ever broken a promise to someone? Well, again, if we're honest, probably at one point or another, probably all of us have done that at one point or another. And what were those consequences when you did break that promise? I remember coming across a little story on the Internet that would probably describe my brothers and I. Uh, I'm the middle child. I have one older brother, Cliff, and then a younger brother named Chris. Uh, to be honest, I could definitely see myself doing this to Chris, my younger brother, and I could definitely see Cliff doing this to me uh, as uh, my older brother. But there is a story of uh, two young boys. They were brothers. And the older brother said to the younger one, I will give you a dollar if I can crack three eggs on top of your head. And the younger brother said, okay, go ahead. So he takes the first egg, then cracks it right on his head, and then takes the second egg, then cracks it on his head. And then the younger brother asks, well, when is the third one coming? Well, the older brother said, well, it's not coming. And the younger brother said, why is that? And the older brother replied, well, if I crack the third egg, then I have to give you a dollar. <laughs> And again, I could definitely see myself doing that to Chris, and again, I could see Cliff doing that to me as well. But even with that, there were consequences of that broken promise, and it was more than just the older brother not paying the younger one a dollar. The younger brother was there with eggs all over his head and probably his face and all that as well. But in all seriousness, when we break our promises for God or with God, there can be serious consequences to that. Mm -hmm. And that is what King Zedekiah and the nation of Judah would face. You see, in our scripture this morning in Jeremiah chapter 34, I want to give you a little bit of background on this before we uh, go into it this morning, because if we don't know the background of this chapter, this chapter is going to make absolutely no sense to you, because Jeremiah is not written uh, linearly. It's uh, taking place during different uh, eras of Jeremiah's ministry. But in Jeremiah 34, this takes place after the third invasion and the final invasion of the nation of Judah before they are deported into Babylon. There are actually three invasions. The first one happened in 605 B.C. after the Battle of Carchemish, which King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon won. And when he won that, then he went down to Judah and he took some of the young men to occupy his court. And of course, we know one of those people that he took was Daniel and his three friends. Then the second one happened in 598 B.C. when King Jehoiakim decided to rebel. And Nebuchadnezzar obviously did not like that decision. And Nebuchadnezzar came down and he not only squashed the rebellion, but he killed King Jehoiakim. And then he decided he was going to take some more people from Judah with him into exile. And during this invasion is when the prophet and priest Ezekiel was taken. Now we get to Jeremiah 34 when the third and final invasion is happening. And that starts in 588 B.C. because King Zedekiah has decided that he's going to rebel against the nation of Babylon. And so Babylon begins to invade and... Jeremiah comes and delivers him a message. And that's where we get to in the first seven verses of chapter 
34. Before we get into it, I'm going to ask you to please join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, again, I just thank you for the opportunity to preach your word this morning. And I just pray that you would open our hearts and open our minds to this passage of Scripture this morning. And Heavenly Father, I just pray through the Holy Spirit that you would help me to preach your word as it is, with as much passion as I can, and pray that you help my words be your words. And I pray for everyone that is here present uh, in person and those joining us on Facebook this morning, and pray that you would open our hearts and open our minds. I pray that they would not only receive the message, Lord, with their hearts and minds, but I also pray that they would apply the message to their lives as well. And I do pray that there is someone either here present or watching on Facebook that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I pray that they would put their faith and trust in Him this morning. And I pray this in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to divide chapter 34 into three parts. And this is dealing with our destiny when it comes to promises from God. So the first thing I want us to know from verses 1 through 7 is that our destiny rests in God's hands. Our destiny rests in God's hands. So let's read verses 1 through 7. It says this. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, when Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon and all his army and all the kingdoms of the earth under his dominion, and all the peoples were fighting against Jerusalem and all of its cities. So we see there in verse 1 that the invasion is, is starting to begin. Nebuchadnezzar has not only brought the Babylonian army, but he's also brought all of his vassal states along with him that he captured along the way to fight against Jerusalem as well. Verse 2, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Go and speak to Zedekiah, king of Judah, and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am giving this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. Ye shall not escape from his hand, but shall surely be captured and delivered into his hand. Ye shall see the king of Babylon eye to eye, and speak with him face to face. And ye shall go to Babylon. So we see here in verses 2 and 3 that the Lord is saying this, first of all, that God has already handed Jerusalem to Babylon before the battle has even begun. So we know that the Lord has orchestrated this because of Judah's sin of continually disobeying the covenant that he made with it. He says that he's going to give the city to the hands of the king of Babylon and that he was going to destroy the city with fire. And he tells Zedekiah also that he will not escape from his hand. Even if he tries, Zedekiah is not going to escape from King Nebuchadnezzar. And he also says that he will see Nebuchadnezzar eye to eye and will talk to him face to face as well. But then he says this in verse 4. It says, Yet hear the word of the Lord, O Zedekiah, king of Judah. Thus says the Lord concerning you, You shall not die by the sword. You shall die in peace. And as spices were burned for your fathers, the former kings who were before you, so people shall burn spices for you, and lament for you, saying, Alas, Lord, for I have spoken the word, declares the Lord. Then Jeremiah the prophet spoke all these words to Zedekiah, king of Judah and Jerusalem, when the army of the king of Babylon was fighting against Jerusalem and against all the cities of Judah that were left, Lachish and Azekah. For these were the only fortified cities of Judah that remained. So here's what Jeremiah tells Zedekiah. He tells him that you will not die by the sword, but you will actually die in peace. And when you die in peace, the people will actually honor you by burning spices for you. Now some will look at this, these verses and, and think that the Jews practiced cremation, but they did not. What they did was, whenever their king died, they would actually burn spices to honor that king's service. But here's the thing that we need to understand. This is why we need to know the context. This is what we call a conditional promise, which means this. If Zedekiah would surrender to Nebuchadnezzar, these things would happen. And you would know that 
through the earlier chapters in Jeremiah. But if Zedekiah did not do that, then these things will not happen. So, despite the expectation that Zedekiah would die if Nebuchadnezzar captured Jerusalem, God promised the king would die peacefully at a later date. So again, if Zedekiah surrendered to Nebuchadnezzar, these sort of things that would happen to him. But we see here in the section in Jeremiah's prophecy of God's sovereignty over individuals, even in the midst of a battle like this. He had already promised Zedekiah if he would follow him that he would die peacefully. Now that does not mean that he would probably not suffer. It does not mean that he would escape Nebuchadnezzar's hand. It just means that he would die peacefully if he surrendered to Nebuchadnezzar. And when we apply it to us today, God will certainly judge each individual. There will come a time where I will stand in front of the God and answer for myself. There will come a time when you will stand in front of the God and answer for yourself. You're not going to have to answer for anybody else's sin or for anybody else's mistake. You only have to answer for yourself. As Jeremiah 31, 29, 30 says, In those days they will not say again, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. And that was a proverb that the Jews had at that time, basically saying that the next generation would suffer for the prior generation's sins. But God says this to Jeremiah. He says, But everyone will die for his own iniquity. Each man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth will be set on edge. So God is saying this. I'm going to get rid of that proverb. You're going to be standing in front of me for your own sins, not for the sins of somebody else. Hebrews 9.27 also says that it is appointed for man to die and then comes the judgment. So we will all one day stand in front of the Lord for our sins. But God does give us the opportunity to put our faith and trust in Him. And that's where His sovereignty comes in. And if, and if it wasn't for Jesus Christ, then none of us would have any hope. So we see in verses 1 through 7, our destiny rests in God's hands. Number 2, in verses 8 through 16... Our destiny depends upon our heart. Our destiny depends upon our heart. So starting in verse 8, it says this. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, after King Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people in Jerusalem to make a proclamation of liberty to them, that everyone should set free his Hebrew slaves, male and female, so that no one should enslave a Jew, his brother. And they obeyed all the officials and all the people that entered into the covenant that everyone would set free his slave, male or female, so they would not be enslaved again. They obeyed and set them free. So here's what King Zedekiah decided to do after he was given this word that we saw in verses 1 through 7. He decides, all right, well, I know in the covenant that we had with God that... We can only hold Hebrew slaves that were in debt to us for six years. And on the seventh year, we're supposed to set them free. And that was actually part of the covenant. In Exodus 21, verse 2, it says, When you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh he shall go free for nothing. So part of the covenant was this. If someone, if a Hebrew owed debt to a fellow Hebrew, they could be an indentured servant or a slave for them for six years. But after six years, they were supposed to be released. Well, obviously, this was just one of many things that the people of Judah did not obey in the covenant. So Zedekiah decided, all right, well, since we're going to be handed over to, to Babylon, according to what the Lord says, maybe if I do this, maybe we can gain some favor with God. So he orders all the people of Judah to release their slaves. And so they went out and they released their slaves, and they all lived there in Jerusalem. But then comes the bad part. Because when we if it just left at that, that all sounds good, right? 
But remember what I just said, that Zedekiah did this to try to earn favor with God. Verse 11, it says, But afterward, and what he means by this is, after he had released the slaves, Babylon had to turn away from Jerusalem for a time because the nation of Egypt was coming to attack them. So they went out and they took care of Egypt. Well, when that happened, Zedekiah and the people of Judah thought, well, they were in the clear that he wasn't going to come anymore. But here's what they did in verse 11. But afterward, they turned around and took back the male and female slaves they had set free and brought them into subjection as slaves. So they went out and took and rounded up everybody that were slaves and took them back in as slaves once they thought they were in the clear. Well, obviously, the Lord was not too happy about that. And so here's his response in verses 12 through 17. Or excuse me, 12 through 16. It says, The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I myself made a covenant with your fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, saying, At the end of seven years, each of you must set free the fellow Hebrew who have been sold to you and has served you six years, and you must set him free from your service. But your fathers did not listen to me or incline their ears to me. Verse 15, You recently repented and did what was right in my eyes by proclaiming liberty each to his neighbor. And you made a covenant before me in the house that is called by my name. So here the Lord is saying that you actually did right. And what they did when they decided to release the slaves, they actually held a, a ceremony there in the temple where they would actually cut a calf in half. Or they would cut several calves in half. They would place half of the calf on one side, and they would place the other half on the other side. And what they would do is they would walk through the middle of it. And basically when they did that, here's what they were symbolizing. They were symbolizing, may I be like these calves if I don't fulfill my end of the covenant. So when Zedekiah and the people of Judah walked in between those calves, they were basically telling God, we're going to release these slaves. But if we go back on it, may you treat us like these calves. <laughs> so they had made a covenant with God saying they were going to release the slaves and then they went back on it. Mm. So obviously when you make a covenant with God and you don't fulfill your end, there are consequences to that. And here's what they were in verse 15. <clears throat> Excuse me, verse 16. But then you turned around and profaned my name when each of you took back his male and female slaves whom you had set free according to their desire, and you brought them into subjection to be your slaves. So we see here they went back on their covenant. But we see here what the main problem was. They did not release the slaves because of their fear of God. They released the slaves because of their fear of the Babylonian army. And there's a big difference between having fear for God and having fear of people. And just like us today, we also have the opportunity and the choice of whether or not to choose God's will for our life or to reject God's will for our life. We are given that choice. Yes, God does draw us to his will, but he still also gives us the opportunity to choose whether we'll obey by his will or we decide we're going to go through things our way. And we see here... The nation of Judah and Zedekiah obviously chose they were still going to do things their way. So we see our destiny rests in God's hands. Our destiny is determined by, or depends on, upon our heart. And then finally, verses 17 through 22, our destiny corresponds to our deeds. Our destiny corresponds to our deeds. Because whatever is in our hearts, will actually will eventually come out through the actions that we do. Mm -hmm. So verse 17, God continues. He says, Therefore, thus says the Lord, you have not obeyed me by proclaiming liberty, every one to his brother and to his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim to you liberty. 
to the sword, to pestilence, and to famine, declares the Lord. So God is telling them, you didn't proclaim liberty for your fellow slaves. So now I'm going to proclaim liberty to you from my protection. So they would be given to the sword, which means they would be killed in battle. They would be given to pestilence, and they would be given to famine. I will make you a whore to all the kingdoms of the earth. And the men who transgressed my covenant did not keep the terms of the covenant that they made before me. I will make them like a calf they cut in two and pass between its parts. The officials of Judah, the officials of Jerusalem, the eunuchs, the priests, and all the people of the land who pass between the parts of the calf. So God is saying this. For those who have went between those two parts of the calf, you're going to be just like that calf now because you went back on the covenant. So in other words, they were all going to be killed because of their disobedience. Verse 20, And I will give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their lives. Their dead bodies shall be food for the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his officials I will give into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their lives, into the hand of the army of the king of Babylon, which was withdrawn from you. Behold, I will command, declares the Lord, and will bring them back to the city, and they will fight against it, and take it and burn it with fire. And I will make the cities of Judah a desolation without inhabitant. And every single one of those words that I've read to you is exactly what God did. The Babylonians did come back because God orchestrated for them to come back. And when they came back, they... It was basically a slaughterhouse. They went and they killed every man that they, they could find. They killed every woman they could find. They killed every child they could find. The majority of the people there were killed. And they also burned every building they could find down to the ground, including the city gates and including the temple as well. But they did round a few of the exiles up. And even King Zedekiah tried to escape. But he was captured a couple of miles down the road in Jericho. And then he was brought in front of King Nebuchadnezzar, both him and his sons. And Nebuchadnezzar made Zedekiah witness in killing his own sons. Mm. And then after that, Nebuchadnezzar took a sword and had it heated by fire. And then they took the sword and they put it against Zedekiah, I mean, excuse me, Zedekiah's eyes and blinded him. And then they took him over to Babylon. And Jewish historical writings say that Zedekiah ended up dying in prison suffering. So obviously there are huge consequences for disobeying the covenant that they had with God. And the city was destroyed and remained uninhabited for the next 50 years. But what we see here is that a right relationship with God results in godly behavior. A right relationship with God results in godly behavior. 2 Corinthians 3, 17-18 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So who is the one that transforms? It is the Holy Spirit that lives inside us. I've said it before, I'll say it again. One of the biggest mistakes that Christians always make is that they try to follow the Lord on their own strength instead of the strength of the Lord. The Israelites already tried that. Trying to follow the Lord on their own strength. It failed miserably. But when the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside us, when we put our faith and trust in, in Christ, the Holy Spirit helps us to transform, become more like Christ over time. Now, we're not going to be perfect until we're in heaven with Jesus one day. But if we continue to follow the Holy Spirit, we'll continue to be more and more like Christ as we continue to follow the Spirit. 
But you see, in order to follow the Spirit, we have to have that right relationship with God. That's what it's all about. If we don't have a right relationship with God, then we're not going to be acting godly, obviously. We have to have that right relationship with God. We saw here that Zedekiah and the nation of Judah did not have a right relationship with God. They kept disobeying Him. And because of that, it resulted in their ungodly behavior. I want to share with you this last story before I conclude. There was this 42-year-old woman from South Bend, Indiana. She called the police after she was sold a, after being sold what she thought was a flat screen TV. See, what happened was she was approached by a man at her front door, and this man offered her a great deal on TV. And he said, I'll sell you this new flat screen TV for $500. Now, I don't know how many of you have been to Walmart lately, but depending on the size of the flat screen TV, it can get up there in price. So obviously she thought, well, that is a good deal, but the problem is I don't really have $500. And she told the man that, so the man said, well, I'll do this one. I'll sell it to you for $300. And she said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll buy it for $300. And so she gives him $300. And the set was bubble wrapped and had Walmart stickers on it and came with a remote control. But when she opened the package, she discovered instead it was an oven door. Mm. Obviously she wasn't too happy when she saw that. But isn't that how Satan usually does to us? He promises good things, and he tries to lure us away from God with good things. But we end up paying the price of disobeying God. You see, Satan will promise you a lot of good things, but what he won't tell you is there are consequences to that. Satan does not want you to know that. He wants you to find that out the hard way. So how can you apply this chapter to our lives today. Well, I think there's three things that we can do real quickly. Number one, we need to ask God for His will in our lives. Because let's just be honest, if you don't know God's will for your life, it's hard to obey it, isn't it? You can't obey something you do not know. Mm -hmm. So how do you find out God's will? Well, number one, you have to be in His Word and know what His Word says because there's all kinds of teachings out there today that are not in line with the Word of God. But here's something else that we need to do as well. We need to spend time in prayer and actually ask God, God, what is your will for my life? What is it that you want me to do? What is the purpose that you have for me? Mm -hmm. Because as Jesus does say, ask and what? You shall receive. James says, if you ask for wisdom, you'll receive it. So if we ask God for his will, for our life, he will certainly reveal that will to you. Now, he may not reveal it all at once to you, but he will reveal it in parts to you, and you keep following in faith, he will continue to reveal more and more to you. But you have to start right at the beginning by asking him, Lord, what is your will for my life? Second, once we do know what that will is, or whatever he reveals to us, then we've got two choices. Either we can follow him, or we don't. If we follow him, then he will certainly bless us. I'm not going to say life's going to be easy because he never promised that life was going to be easy. Even if we do follow him, but he will be there with us. Or we can choose not to follow him and then we suffer the consequences of our choice. And then the final one. There is nowhere in the Bible that says that we are required to enter in a covenant with God. However, we do choose to enter in a covenant with Him. You better follow through with it. Because if not, then judgment is surely ahead. I'm sure many of us have heard many stories of people saying, Well, Lord, if you do this for me, I'll go to church this Sunday. Or, Lord, if you give me this amount of money, I'll tie you know, this much to the church. You know, those types of promises. You know, we may laugh when we hear those type of things, but people do do those type of promises. 
But here's the thing. If you say something like that, you better follow through with it. Because if not, the consequences will be ahead. You see, promises are not just words when it comes to God. When God makes a promise to us, he follows through with it. Whether it's for blessing or whether it's for judgment. And I hope and pray that this morning, if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I hope and pray that you will do that this morning because the Bible does say that when you put your faith and trust in Him, that He will not only save you from your sins, but the Holy Spirit will come live inside you and He will transform you and conform you to be more like Him. And then you will be in heaven with Him forever and ever and ever. But the, but the Bible also promises that if you don't put your faith and trust in Him, that you will stand in front of the Lord at what's called the great white throne judgment. And there you will be condemned into the lake of fire where you'll be eternally separated from God. And God will follow through with that. He will do it with a broken heart. Because He does not desire that for anybody. He desires for all to be saved. But he leaves that choice up to you on whether or not you take him up on that promise. And I do promise you that he will follow through with that promise of saving you if you put your faith and trust in him. Amen. So I'm going to ask you to join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, again, I just thank you for the opportunity to preach your word this morning. And I just thank you, Lord, for the reminder that promises are not just words when it comes to you. Heavenly Father, when you make a promise, you always follow through, whether it's in blessing or whether it's in judgment. And Heavenly Father, I do pray specifically for those that, that may be here, either here in person or joining us on Facebook, that may have never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, I just pray for it. That they would take you up on that promise. I pray that the Holy Spirit would draw them to you. And that they would put their faith and trust in you. And Heavenly Father, I do pray for those that either here in person or those joining us on Facebook that have already made that decision. And have put their faith and trust in you. But they may have strayed away in their faith. Heavenly Father, the great thing that you say in your word when that does happen, and it's happened to all of us, I know it's happened to me included, that we can still come back to you. And we thank you for that. And I pray that there is someone here that, that knows that they may have strayed away from you. I pray that they would realize that today they can still come back to you and start again. Because just like the prodigal son came back to his father, you'll be there waiting for us with open arms. And I pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of invitation is uh, number 502, Tis so, Tis so Sweet to Trust in Jesus. And what, what better can to sing about promises that God gives to us? Because it is sweet to trust in Jesus. And I'm going to ask uh, Pastor David if you could be up front for the invitation. But I want to extend that invitation to you this morning. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, first, you repent of your sin, which means you stop doing things your way and you start doing things God's way. Because the Bible says that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Second, you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and arose again the third day to conquer your sin. And to conquer death. And then third, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he's your Lord and Savior. God, I promise you here this morning, right where you're sitting, or those of you that, that are watching on Facebook, right where you're at right now, God will save you from your sins. Amen. And if you have made that decision, I encourage you this morning to make that known to everyone else here this morning. Because what better decision? And you make them to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Right. And you may say, well, Jeffrey, you don't know what I've done. You're right, I don't know what you've done.
done, and I'm not going to ask you what you've done. Because you're not going to be standing in front of me on Judgment Day. But God knows what you've done, but you know what God says? Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Mm. And whosoever means you, no matter what you've done in the past. Mm. He wants you to come to him. If you're interested in rededicating your life or any other decision you need to make, uh, again, Pastor Dave would be up here to talk with you about that. But whatever decision you have to make, I hope and pray that you make it this morning before we leave. As we stand and sing together in number 502, this is so 